So there's been a number of content creators that have discovered some oddities in the VV blockchain. I want to discuss some of that. What are my thoughts on it? Is it something to be leery of? Maybe. So there's a lot of great content creators that are able to now, with more of the metadata on IMX uh, blockchain, to really look at specifically what's going on with all these collectibles. I'll just name a couple of them. Uh, one would be Hotel Fandom. He's a great channel. You should follow him. He kind of looks at macro events. Uh, he has a lot of expertise in that. And then obviously goes and kind of searches for bots and other things. Uh, one of the really initial people I remember back in the day that did a lot of that investigation is a guy on Twitter named Pyromaniac. So you should give him a follow. Very interesting. Uh, more recently, it's been someone like Vivi Fox. I've talked about that a lot. She does kind of more in-depth uh, analysis of, of a lot of different the entire marketplace but more more coll individual collectibles right now and then the person who kind of found out some of these IDs and has been looking at wallets is only daily burn once again I'll link all these below you should give them a follow very interesting and uh, he kind of pointed out a couple things that um, the very first common spider-man seems to not all add up and we don't quite understand what happened with some of the wallets and whatnot uh like i said i'll link the videos below and you can get into that so what does that mean from kind of a ten thousand foot level what does that mean going forward should we be worried um i just want to talk about my thoughts on it what does it mean for the now what does it mean for the future and uh and it's it, Anytime there are discrepancies, anytime you don't understand anything, I think as a community, uh, whether it be any, you know, any product, you should ask that company some questions. And I think those are being done. Um, and so my video here isn't necessarily to dig in deep and ask those questions. I think a lot of people are doing that online, on Twitter, etc. I just wanted to look at it from a different perspective and kind of see it from the, you know, high level what is going on here and what do we think so the word that everybody uses um is transparency and that you hear it again and again uh in the nft space obviously crypto and really in, you know in anything we want to understand what is going on um, from a particular company so you know if we're somebody who's buying their products you know we know what's going on and one of the interesting things with blockchain is obviously it is really from a production and then transaction level all public more so really than any of these physical goods say so the one i always would bring in to be would be comics and i do have a breakdown of that i'll discuss that in a second or two but you know you really do know you know for example how many mints there are and what transactions have taken place so that in itself allows for a transparency and then allows the community to ask questions about oddities that you could never do once again i'll just take it to the comic book world um and i'll give some examples of where where things have been a little bit goofy or we just don't know and could never know um and so i will talk about it as the ecosystem of vv and co digital collecting and where i think it's at right now i've obviously been involved about a year and a half i think it's still good to go but Let's get into it. Okay, so one of the things I'll compare here is kind of this physical versus digital collecting uh, concept. And uh, in the physical world, especially comics and really collectibles in general, one of the most important pieces is this element of scarcity. Um, in the physical world, it's very, very difficult to know what that is. Um, you want to trust people, you want to... But, for example, Marvel doesn't release what their print numbers are. Um, people guess or sometimes people can find them through different distribution and they look around and they pull these together uh, They can get a feel for it. They certainly know that there may be not a hundred thousand of these things Maybe and there's less but you know the numbers a lot of times are estimates And then when you're looking at variants, which would be like for example if they have one comic and there's a one in 25 in other words you had to order 25 of one comic to get another it's difficult so you know, once again, if there's 100,000, 1 in 25, maybe, you know, you can do some numbers, but not every, you know, comic book shop is going to order 25. Very few do. So because comic shops, you know, um, a lot of them aren't as big as others. So it's very interesting in trying to find these numbers. And it it matters a little bit when you're like, oh, I really like this comic. I want to, you know, I'm going to, instead of spending, you know, $5 on it, I'm going to get this, you know, cool variant that's $25. And not obviously, you know, it's a buying decision. But when you get like we know into 
you know, really high end comics or really high end collectibles that are, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 25,000, you know, etc. You really want to know a lot about that collectible. How many are available? How many have been destroyed? How many, you know, and in a physical world, it's just very, very difficult. So let's just bring other information that honestly you would never know um, would be number of owners. Uh, the authenticity is always an issue. Obviously, there's these grading companies and we trust them and we think that they're doing a good job, but that's an issue. And it's never, maybe not even an authenticity, especially when it comes down to, you know, certain reprints. Collectors that are newer maybe don't have the eye and so different reprints do confuse them and they spend money that they shouldn't. That's happened a lot on the Ultimate Fallout 4, Facsimile and others because they're so close, so that happens. Um, tracking price is done by a lot of mechanisms like Go Collect and others and eBay. You can go to eBay and look at the sold. But once again, you're not seeing the grand picture of everything. Um, and the last thing would be like signing things. Um, there's been all kinds of issues. Obviously, uh, like CGC, you have to literally have one of the representatives who visually can see the uh, particular artist sign it. Um, CBCS has some sort of, you know, technology that has been shown to be duped sometimes where they look at look at signing. So once that is established in the blockchain, you would think that they would be able to authenticate that user when they sign it. That could be much more credible maybe than it is right now. So there's all these different elements that the physical has that the digital will have. And so um, I think that's when you're looking at it from a you know wider lens, and you're looking at where is this going to go, I think that that bodes well for the digital collecting ecosystem. Now, there's all kinds of other elements, which I would add to it, that we have seen um, over the last year and a half, which would be, you know, there's the, well, there's the one element that people always say is, it opens the door for more collectibles around, the, collectors around the world because they may not have, they may live in an apartment, they may live in a smaller house, they may be moving a lot, if you have a lot of, you know, whatever it might be, comics, that'd be my thing. You know, if you have a thousand comics, that's a lot of boxes of comics. It's pretty difficult to move all those around. You have to have space. Luckily, I have my basement here where I keep a lot of my stuff. But, you know, if I want, if I was moving every, you know, six months, that would be pretty difficult to, call it to haul that around. Digital collecting allows for that. Uh, the other element would be, of course, like, we don't know as we're looking into the future how people... People's minds change around collecting. So, for example, back when I was younger, we would collect CDs. And before that, obviously, you know, there was, you know, records. Um, and that was a big thing. It was inconceivable to me that in the future I would ever not collect CDs because I love music. It was also inconceivable to me that I would ever be open-minded to just renting music. That seems just, you know, if I rewind myself to, you know, age 16, when uh, we used to go buy CDs, I, w that's inconceivable to me. I would want to own that particular song, that particular CD or cassette tape. You know, I had a lot of cassette tapes as well. And so now if you look at my kids and other people, you know, getting a subscription to iTunes and having, you know, every song at their disposal you know, they're not really into owning music. So their just concept of it all has changed. This is where our, I, that gets a little bit away from us in digital collecting where we're collecting different things specifically. But you can see how the digital landscape changes people's minds over time. And so right now, as we know, most people are like, it's inconceivable that I would collect any of these digital things. But you can see how in, you know, literally only 10, you know, 15 years, People's minds have changed. Obviously, you look at video streaming as well. I used to collect DVDs. Um, I don't do that anymore. Um, I have bought some of them uh, through different variant services. Like there's this uh, company called Voodoo where you can buy the digital 4K version of a movie. But even that I've gone away from because you can stream it. You just subscribe. So now the negative, of course, is now you are paying money forever to these different various companies. But I don't think we quite understand where all that's going, the streaming um, and maybe it will swing back around and people want to own stuff again. And that's where NFTs and other digital collectibles come into play. We don't know. But certainly when I buy yeah, this one service that I use, Voodoo, V-U-D-U, Voodoo is the name of the um, video service. When I bought my movies there, I own them. They're in my account. 
but I cannot resell them. And of course, we understand that as, you know, digital collectors, NFTs, that's one of the great pieces. You could then take it and go put it back on the market, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that um, really when you're talking about these variances, now we need answers, I think, on some of these things. Hopefully we'll get them from Vivian. You know, what happened to this initial, you know, 17,000 common Spider-Mans, you know, this and that. It looks like there may be some sort of inconsistencies in this Voltron drop that's just happening today. So I don't know um, what's happening there. But overall, when you're looking at an ecosystem, and, you know, obviously I would even extend that to like bat cowls, any really NFT project, we, for this to catch on and for it to be grander and bigger, um, you need these couple things. And I wrote them down. So one of them is you need credibility. I think that the blockchain technology with Bitcoin, I think it's been around literally for years and years and years and years now, is quite credible and people understand that these are immutable pieces that, you know, literal and decentralized. It's going to be very, very difficult from um, a blockchain uh, perspective to uh, get around what these particular transactions. Now, I do understand that IMX is layer two. There's some elements there, but at least conceptually, people understand that. I think it has to be consistent. In other words, are they able to deliver products? Um, are they able, as people consistently able to, to sell things, etc.? There obviously has been some hiccups along the way, but for the most part, and even when you look at the grander, greater world in OpenSea and, you know, backhauls and everything, these marketplaces are open and people are able to transact. So that is, you know, really, really important. And from an ease of use, it's, it's, it's getting better. Um, obviously, VV, one of the big things is you can just, you know, get an app. Now you do have to KYC. Another you know, thing they've talked about trying to change that a little bit. But for the most part, it is super easy to buy these um, digital collectibles. Um, so that is, I think, getting better. will continue to get better. And um, I think as more people get into crypto, it'll just be easier and easier and easier. As we know, there's a very, very small percentage of people overall in the world that are into crypto and digital collecting, in NFTs, etc. So that brings me to my last, last thing here. So if we have a consistent, credible, trustworthy uh, ecosystem marketplace for people to transact and the products are being consistently um, created, people are buying these products, um, the last piece of it really is... Um, are you able to consistently attract new users to that ecosystem? So, for example, if you take it back to the physical world, is you know Marvel able to create new comics that people want to read? Um, well, they have a track record of you know fifty plus years or whatever, sixty plus years in which they've been able to do that. So, that's great. Um, is Vivi is Backhouse? You know that is yet to be determined. Um, if you take it even to like, for example, say like Disney, they have you know. 100 year record of being able to come up and create and attract new users you know they had you know snow white but then they had elsa and after that they had Moana. you know so they've been able to come up with new characters and new stories that they're able to attract new users now the question is is can vivi can back howls uh that i think we do not know we're we're still learning about and there's all these other I would say mechanical elements along the way that have to be worked out, which, you know, we've talked about those before, which would be like MCP, the master collector program. Although um, crypto, where you can buy um, gems with crypto, apparently is working. It's in beta. A number of people have reported they've been able to do it. We don't know where digital collecting is going, but you wonder, and once again, I'm just making this up, but you wonder if, you know, you have a, a big time collector in the future, you know, you fast forward it 10, 20 years, and they're like, I'm going to invest $10,000 you know, or whatever it might be. You know, Why would I do it in a physical thing? I don't know really how many of these things there are. In the digital collecting world, I can go look at the mint number and it's in the blockchain. You know, I don't know how many times this thing has exchanged hands in the physical world, but in the, in the, in the digital world they would. So it'd be funny, you, know, you look at, you know, maybe you make up my kids' kids or something like that. They would say, you know, it's just crazy that you would ever try and invest money in some of these physical things. You just don't know, is it authentic? You just don't know all these things where in a digital world it would. I don't know if that's where it's going, but that'd be pretty interesting. Anyway, thanks for listening. I'll talk to you all soon.